How is it going, ladies and gentlemen? This is Sean Barnes. I want to welcome you back to The Way of the Wolf. Our guest today is a gentleman named Tim Howard. He is the founder of Fortify Experts with a focus on building high-performing teams in the cybersecurity space, heavy emphasis on people, processes, and technology. Tim. Welcome to The Way of the Wolf. I am certainly glad to be here, Sean. Thanks for having me. This is going to be a fun conversation. Uh, I know we met for Caulfield a little while back and just absolutely hit it off. There's so much alignment. Really happy that you have a chance to come on the show. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Man, so a lot of different things that I want us to cover. But one thing that I do want to focus on is... In my experience, whenever I see technology professionals, they're growing in their career because they are extremely intelligent. They're great at what they do, yeah. whether that's designing data centers, understanding AI, or development. It doesn't seem to matter, but they find themselves in a senior executive role and start to struggle. They start to get flustered. They get frustrated have you experienced that? And then what has been your initial thoughts whenever you hear me talk about that? Mm. It's very common, especially I work with uh, CISOs, the chief information security officers really across the country, work with every, um, every level from what I call the, the smaller company, where it's really more of a director level security leader, all the way up to Fortune 500 uh, CISOs. And um, it is very interesting to see kind of the uh, progression of how these folks um, really proceed in their careers. <clears throat> You'll find um, so many of them have come up through the technical ranks, right? But there's a glass ceiling that I see happen all the time. And it's because they focus on the technology and not as much as, of the business, and, and so there's a, I coach a lot of CISOs when it comes down to this and how do they start being more strategic instead of technical? Um, and it's a challenge when you're in a smaller company, you're asked to be drawn down into the technology space. And so how, uh, what I work with them is how do you continue to sound more like an executive? And because you're always going to be pushed down to the level of which you, at which you talk. So if you're talking like a, a technical person, the, the board, the CIO, whoever you're reporting into is going to say, well, that's a technical person. I'm going to leave them at that level. And so this is something that I, I talk with a, a lot of these leaders about is how do you start elevating your language to start sounding like the executives. Oh, okay. All right. So yes, I have witnessed this. Admittedly, I've experienced this as I was progressing in my career, highly focused on the technology. I would walk into the boardroom, walk into senior management meetings and talk about the technology because my mindset was, well, I have to be the smartest person in the room. I have to show them how smart I am. It took me way too long to recognize that that's not the right approach. And eventually I ended up learning how important it is to listen, mm -hmm. get your foot in the door. You do that because you are technically comp competent. You do that because you're good at what you do. Once you start stepping into those bigger rooms, take the time to listen and learn because they know more than you do at that level. Once you start listening, you can start absorbing. You can start understanding how they communicate, the type of language and verbiage that they use. They don't care about how to configure a switch or a firewall. No, their conversations are much bigger. So as technology professionals, as we progress and get into those rooms, that's something that we have to be cognizant of. And we have to take the time, we have to check our own egos because we're used to being the smartest in the room and just listen, start understanding how they communicate and then start incorporating that in to who you are and how you communicate. Plus it gives you an opportunity to learn if you just listen. Yeah, that's so true. And I'll tell you something's occurring, especially in the security world, it may be across technology, but um, 
especially last year in 2023, uh, there was a changing of the guard that was going on at this leadership level. <clears throat> and a lot of it was out with the old guard, bring in the new, because I think <clears throat> there was a couple of reasons. One, obviously there was a, um, there was pressure financially from a lot of these companies. There's also pressure to add diversity. But I think what the, the biggest thing I saw was the old mindset of uh, more of an authoritarian technologist that's at the, at the helm. And they're not really thinking creativity, creatively um, as well as they're not thinking what's best for the business. And... And so where I've seen the the trend move are those folks that are, you know, more of an MBA, you know, they've got an MBA or they've done some business um, kind of work. You know, they're not just focused on the technology side that the reality is they're they're reading like the 10 K's of a, of a company. So they understand what the actual challenges are that the company is going through and they're thinking about how how can i as a technologist enable the company to achieve those goals and that's a different mindset they're not enamored with the technology they're enamored with how do i enable the company to be better and sometimes those those uh, new minds that come in are more progressive in thinking about that and so especially for the older technologist they need to start thinking thinking differently about, okay, it's not just about how do I implement this next better technology. It's really, how do I, how do I take the company um, and enable it to be better than its competitors through technology? So that could be, how do I enable AI? How do I, how do I bring in more automation? How do I um, uh, give them some sort of an advantage over the competition through what we do? And, and so I've just seen that as um, what businesses are looking for is enablers. So it, th that's kind of what I, where I'm, I'm seeing the trend. Yeah, and, and I'd have to agree, right? There's a shift that has to occur with these technology professionals because keeping the lights on or having the latest servers that are fully patched, that's the bare minimum. Yeah. If you can't do that, then you probably need to go somewhere else, right? So that is the bare minimum that's expected from these C-suite executives or senior leaders in an organization. Now, that shift in mindset to go from being focused on maximum uptime into how do we use technology as a business enabler there's a lot of steps that have to occur because technology professionals, we have to shift our mindset into one of, okay, it's no longer about this. Yes, it is. But also, I have to learn about the business. I have to start reading the 10 Ks. I have to start listening to the challenges that these business leaders are dealing with. And whenever I think back, I, one thing that I did struggle with was I had this mindset of the technology works, everything's fantastic. And I would go sit down with C-level executives, hey, what's going on? How can I support you? Now, their mindset was, my printer works, I'm, I'm fine, I don't need you. It wasn't until I had the opportunity to step in and also start leading human resources where it forced that exposure to these senior executives because then they were asking me, well, I've got this employee relations issue. How do I handle it? Now, at first, I didn't know how, but I learned. And what that did is it gave me gave them insight into how my mind operates and how I solve problems. So the name of the game is really how do you get more exposure? How do you know enough about the business to showcase that you have these skills, to show them that you can solve their problems by leveraging technology? Mm. Yeah, I love that. In, in fact, it really brings up a quote that uh, I, I get an opportunity. I host uh, monthly CISO forums. And so I'll have 50 CISOs from all walks of life that come uh, and join these forums. And we always pick a monthly topic. Uh, you know, this last month was how to lead like a Fortune 500 CISO. This month is is more about, you know, how to, how to drive enterprise reporting. You know, just so there's always a, a different topic. But um, 
One of the quotes that came out of this one, Brian Toe, former uh, uh, Fortune 500 CISO, actually said, those that know how will always work for those that, work, that, that know why. And so you got to know the why. It, often, especially in technologists, uh, they're like, okay, we're going to implement this technology well, sure, let's go figure out how to do it. These are all the things that we have to do in order to get it implemented right. And, and it's great because, you know, maybe you'll do the business analysis and say, this is, these are all the reasons and how we need to configure it and it's going to work really well. But if you're not asking the questions of why do we need to put this in there? What's it going to do to the business? What, you know, or, or how is the, this going to... Um, uh, impact the business for or move it forward. Um, if you're not asking those questions of the executives, uh, you're just not going to get there. You know, you, you've just got to continue to be saying, why are we doing this? Why as a business are we going the, down this path? And if you can then participate in that, right? So, So these are the challenges that the executives have. Well, how can I participate in that decision and move them forward? Because now they look at you as a partner, not as a worker. That speaks to the power of asking the right questions. Again, I've experienced this myself where I wanted to walk into the room and prove that I was the smartest person in the room. It didn't really work all that well. I'm sure I came across as, well, Mr. Egomaniac over here. But what I have found is if you're able to walk into the room and ask the right questions that are thought provoking, Mm. people immediately pick up, well, wait a second. Okay, that makes sense. That's why we need to do this. And so what you're doing is you're indicating that you know what's going on, that you know how to solve problems, Mm -hmm. and you ask the right questions, kind of like a trail of breadcrumbs to get them there. They get to the solution on their own, and you were basically just that guide that was shining a light. You don't have to brag about how much you know. You showcase by just asking the right questions. Mm, Yeah. That's really good. In fact, one of these comments was, um, if you want to be seen as an executive, you need to act presidential, right? So what, so what does a, a president need to do? They need to really understand what's, what's happening across the entire chasm, not just in your little area. And so if you walk in confident, but, but, it's like you're observing every individual around the table. So if you're thinking about finance, how, how are you going to impact finance? How are you going to impact each ind- individual business unit, the, uh, the COO and the, the CEO? What's going to be important to each one of those individuals? And you need to be conscious about what, what are they trying to get out of it? And the bigger the company that you get into – really the more political this becomes. So you got to be very politically aware. And so I'm, I'm curious, when you kind of stepped into those, how, how did that impact you, right? So you're now um, starting to go, oh, I, instead of me just saying this is what I need, what I hear all of these individuals saying is we need to build consensus. We need to, we need to start building advocates throughout this, uh, this community, the executive community that when I go to ask for something, I need to know they're going to say yes before I ever ask for it. So I need to start building, um, uh, kind of my team of supporters when I've got a big project that's coming along and I need to start selling it really early. You know, not not just when when I think that the answers are when um, I need somebody to support me. I need to build that a long time before I actually ask the question. Okay, this is a great topic, and I do want to kind of dive into it because a lot of technology executives they're so busy fighting fires constantly yeah. that the thought of 
building relationships, building trust, gaining a holistic understanding of the entire organization seems un completely unrealistic. It takes time. And one of the things that I've found to be extremely beneficial is if you take the time to solve little problems over and over and over. Yes, you have to keep the lights on. That is important. But you start adding value and I'm going to solve your printer issue. Okay, now, oh, well, you had an issue with your ERP system. Well, let me knock that out for you. Oh, now you're trying to open a new location. Well, I can get that solved for you. So you start building momentum. And in that process, you're building trust because you're solving more and more problems. The bigger the problems you start to solve, the more exposure you get to other areas in the organization, the more you learn about other areas of the organization. So this is just kind of this flywheel effect. It just builds momentum, builds momentum. You're learning. You're building trust. You're building relationships so that when you do come to the table and say, I need a quarter million dollars to implement this cybersecurity stack to protect our organization, cool, no problem, make it happen. Yeah. And and as I hear, you know, you don't ask for that unless you know it's already going to be approved, right? And some, sometimes you would go and say, hey, I know this is what we need um, in order to move our company forward. And you're building up this this um, uh, support structure throughout the organization, but maybe they're going through a financial, financially difficult time. And therefore, is this the right timing to be asking for it? And so it's all about, if I don't have the support, then don't waste your political, you know, uh, uh, capital. capital, exactly, that don't waste that on something that you may not get approved. Sometimes you got to continue to build it up, and it may be next year before we can actually get approved, but you're continuing to campaign for it throughout that year and go, if the business climate is not ready to support it, then you haven't either done your work or it's just not the right time. And so, to again, as a, as a technology executives, um, you need to really understand where the business is and start looking at what are the... What are the risks of the business? Uh, is is are they big enough to support that yet? And is the benefit and the ROI there to really support it? And you got to balance it out with what else are they going to spend money on? I mean, could they could they just hire more salespeople and increase their revenue and make a bigger impact on the company than supporting your project? And so you got to start looking from a from a CFO standpoint, where's the best use of money? And if you haven't convinced them what the best use of money is, you got more work to do. Yeah, you really do. It, well, that's what it comes down to. If you get a no, all right, cool, more time to learn, more time to better understand the product. Now, I will never forget my experiences. Uh, I've done <laughs> many, many multi-million dollar budgets over the years. One company that I worked for, the budgeting process annually would take three to four months. It was an absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. I reported the VP of finance and I had a, a multi-million dollar budget. I was up at the office like after nine o'clock one night, he came over to my office. He's like, hey, you've got this cell messed up. I went and looked, it was 32 cents off in a multi-million dollar. I was like, okay, come on. Is that really? Okay. Now, in in contrast, years go by, and I started to better understand the business. I started to understand when you ask for the big budget to implement a new technology solution. I, I didn't waste my political capital at the wrong time. Oil and gas, very cyclical. If they're going through a downturn, that is not the time to ask for an entirely new system. You have to ride that wave out and get into the Goldilocks zone, which I want to talk about here in a moment. But in any event, Years go by, I had an, I was working for another company by this point in time, but sat down to review the budget, went through all my pages of like everything, justification. It's like a 30, 45 minute meeting with the CEO. He says, cool, make it happen. Mm. Now, that's a stark contrast when you spend three to four months just sifting through every single transaction, which is a little bit on the excessive side, right? There's a pendulum here. 
And then you go over, once you've built that reputation and brand for delivering results and the organizational leaders trust you, you sit down, this is what we need. Cool. Make it happen. Mm -hmm. That's the power of trust. And then also not wasting my political capital at the wrong time. Again, back to the awareness of the broader organization. What is the financial state of the business? If it's publicly traded, you've got the K's and Q's to look through, right? You can, you should know what's going on in the organization. You should know when you should or should not ask for additional yeah. funding. And, and I think that plays into sometimes it's not just asking for more. Sometimes it's recognizing the, the cost-cutting savings that you can go through. So, for instance, if your, your company is not having a great year, can you be proactive you know, in saying, hey, what, uh, I've identified four or five areas where I think we can, we can save money. Maybe it's through my own organization. You know, often IT uh, executives um, are building an empire. And they're, they've got a lot of pride and ego and, and, you know, all of us want to have our own empire. But if you can come back and say, look, I'm willing to give up something this year to help the business, you build that political capital, right? Now, now you, have, you have helped the, the business, the CFO, like, okay, he's not always coming back and asking for more money. This year, he actually said, look, I, I can take that out. We've, we've moved maybe our ERP system forward enough where I can jettison some of this support. We're in, we're in maintenance mode. I don't really need all that. So let's push it off. Or I think what's happened in the security world this year has been we, after kind of COVID happened, uh, and we realized a lot of the weaknesses because of remote, remote workers, there was a spike, I mean, a pretty major spike. We increased uh, security spend by almost 30% over about uh, a year and a half after COVID. It, it spiked well above the, the normal um, uh, trajectory of cybersecurity increases. Okay, we normally increase about 3 to 4% a year, uh, and we literally went up about 30% in a really short period of time. And What's happened this year is in a little bit of a financial crisis, companies looked at it and go, why are we still spending at that rate? And, and they proactively came back and said, we're cutting you back to the core. And what they're really doing is cutting us back to the, the trend line. If you take a, a 10-year trend line, it, there was this spike that went up, but now we're back down to what that trend line was. So the, the bean counter said, wait a minute, let's go back. And we just had this spin because we solved a lot of the, the technology issues that we had that we identified during COVID. So we don't need to continue to spend at that rate. And, and so if you were a leader and you came back and said, look, we've solved it and we're going to we're going to take a a nice dip. We don't need to spend at that level. You could have been the hero in the story instead of being upset because a bean counter has come and taken that away from you. Man, that's such a a powerful approach. And to your point of building political capital, when you come to the table and you're willing to take a haircut before everybody else. I do have experience in that arena during one of the downturns in oil and gas coming to the executives and the executives like, okay, we're going to cut X, X percentage of salaries across the board. And whenever I run the numbers and say, okay, well, I've spoken to my team, we're actually going to go deeper than that. And we did a tiered approach that the top executives in within my organizations we took deeper cuts and then we kind of layered it down so that as people were making less annual salary, it was impacting them less. But you come to the table and say, okay, well, I know that we're going to do this across the board, but I've had the conversations with my team. And because we want to help, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. A very interesting thing happened whenever I had that conversation. There was a pause in the room. Wow. That... I, I am shocked. I am floored that you are willing to take a cut 
for the betterment of the organization. You know what? The rest of us at this level, we're going to take the same cuts as you. You are leading up the chain of command. You are inspiring yeah. and influencing and showing that's what real leadership is. And if you are in a senior leadership role and your ego is too massive, well, I'm not going to take a pay cut. I'll just fire more people. Man, that's not the right approach. Yeah. You know, it makes your it makes your next ask so much easier because now they know that that you are you are literally um in it for the business. You're not just in it to build an empire. So when you're when you're when your next ask, ask comes along, they're like, okay, well, if he's asking for it now, he must really need it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a, a lot easier yeah. for sure. And also, for those of you listening, it's not just technology professionals that like to build empires. Right. I, I have definitely seen that. Okay. So how do we get these technology professionals? to shift into that mindset. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you coach a lot of CISOs, and I know you coach a lot of IT executives. That is a monumental shift mentally to go from that highly proficient, with a technical aptitude off the chart, individual contributor into a force multiplier that yeah. understands the business and understands how technology can change the business. And it's not just, well, I'm going to change the business by protecting it with a cybersecurity stack, right? Well, that's one piece of it, but having that holistic understanding. And, and I know my experience is very unique in that going from IT to HR and then safety and transportation, you know, all these different areas, very few technology professionals get to jump domains like that. So how do you help them get there? So your experience is actually a, a similar experience of what I think most leaders should have, right? So the, having a, a, a diversity of experiences broadens your horizon dramatically. Now, I, I definitely understand where you don't often get a chance as a technology leader to step into some of these other roles. But I will say that every executive and, and really anybody that's trying to climb the por- corporate ladder needs a coach. It, in fact, I, I personally have several coaches myself. And if you're not, if you're not um, coachable, I mean, often that's the, our challenge is our egos get in the way that make us not coachable. And we got to realize that there are other people, they might be older, more wise. Uh, we might uh, be able to learn a lot from them, but the reality is we can also learn from younger, um, younger perspectives, as I'll say. And so that's my first bit of advice is that you need to start thinking about being coachable. Because if we're not moving and continually learning, we're, we're regressing, especially in technology. It's, it is dramatically changing. Executive profiles are dramatically changing. We used to, we, it used to be acceptable to be the uh, author, authoritarian style management. Um, it's, it's really changed to becoming more of a servant leader management. And, and so if you don't understand what that is, you need to find somebody that can help you in that space. Um, understanding emotional intelligence and reading people, you know, is a real skill that can be developed. I had a great conversation uh, yesterday with it, with a CISO that, uh, actually a CIO that said, um, that that's been her biggest win has been um, actually studying emotional intelligence. She was like, you know, I was having a really hard time getting along with one of my uh, other uh, executives because they were just kind of a harsh person. And what it taught uh, her to do was understand them for the character that they are and why they are that way, and then start communicating in a way that actually enhances that communication style. And so with leaders, I often think, okay, technology is great. Leadership is uh, in the technology world is good. But a couple of things that you can do is understanding people better, how they react, how they work, um, um, 
and and their behavioral styles and things of that sort. Um, so that's that's just one of the areas. Right? So so much to unpack there, right? It, just this morning, we made a post on the podcast LinkedIn page about it, it was from another episode that I had recorded where I was talking about how much farther I could have been in my career had I checked my own ego and went and started working with a coach. I have yeah. I have a coach now as well. And it's something that took me a very long time. There was a few factors to why I didn't want to coach. And one of them was ego and the other was expense or cost. Because growing up without any money, you're like, oh, I got to hold on to this. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. And I did. It just took me a very long time, 15 years of just grinding away until I finally recognized, my God, I can accelerate this process significantly by investing in a coach. And I use the term investing very intentionally yes. because it is an investment. It's not a cost. You have to find the right coach. That is something that is very important that you do in this process. Now, another thing that you touched on is building this executive profile or presence and then going into understanding EQ, understanding personality profiles. And one of the things that I love to teach is DISC profiles and assessments, doing workshops with teams and organizations. A lot of our customers, they love them because we layer in in, uh, elements of leadership and coaching and, and talk through business challenges and issues. But once you start to understand these different behavioral styles, and you can use DISC or Berkman or TTI, mm-hmm. there, you know, there's tons of them out there, right? They all serve a similar purpose in raising awareness of ourselves, but also better understanding those that you're working with. So if you choose to go down this path to start better understanding people, choose a tool and stick with that tool for your organization. That was a turning point for me, mm-hmm. going from that individual contributor that was so focused on the technology to leading people, my hand was forced. I quickly recognized I could no longer be that keyboard warrior sitting in my office with the door closed and lead a team of HR professionals or deal with employee relations issues in a business. It it completely shifted my life. And it was that ch- that transition was challenging for me. A trick that I learned, and this is something that IT professionals, this message might resonate with, and it's going to sound funny, but if you start learning how to view people as data sets, Hmm. understanding, I know Tim, he lives in Willis, he has chickens, he has a family, he has dogs, these are the things that motivate and inspire him, these are the things that get him torqued up and upset and worked up, this is what he wants to accomplish. Those are all data points about Tim. And once I start viewing you as a data set, as crazy as that sounds, my mind operates that way. And once I know that about Tim, and I know these things about Jason, and I know these things about Sally, now I layer that across what I know about the business, what opportunities exist, where can I plug in Tim? Where can I plug in Jason? So that was a huge lesson that I learned in helping me transition from being that IT professional focused on data to understanding and working with people. Now, that sounds like a very not personal approach, but it does work. But it is personal because, um, in fact, <laughs> we could spend an hour just on this topic, really. So so I'm a, a certified Berkman guy. And again, I don't think it's as important on the type of uh, – solution that you use or personality or behavioral uh, sol- uh, system as it is um, an understanding an individual and what makes them tick. And so one thing that I do is I'll take these Berkmans and it's a 30 page report. It, it's, it's probably the most intense personality and behavioral uh, uh, process out there. It's probably more intense than most people like to go into, which is why you really need to have a consultant explain this stuff. But when you say data set, that really resonates with me because I'm a data guy. In cybersecurity, you're, you're, you know, you uh, accumulate all kinds of data and you layer it and you look for correlations and, and how that impacts things. So in the Berkman, it's got multi different layers in there. But the end result is... Um, what I coach is building a team around diversity of 
thought. So this is different than regular diversity. So diversity and inclusion, okay, that's all important. But the reality is if you can build a team around diversity of thought, it will be more creative, more productive, um, and, and you'll actually find more enjoyment in, within that team. And what I mean by this is, is you need a team that thinks differently from each other. So, for instance, you need somebody that's um, a decision maker, a driver. So that's probably going to be more of a leadership type person. Not always, but somebody that can make a decision with very little bit of information. You need somebody that's a really good communicator on there. That's that's kind of the salesperson, right? And and I'm not just talking about a company. I'm talking this could be an IT team. You know, you need a good communicator in there that can communicate with the other business units and and things of that sort. You need somebody that's a deep thinker. Often we don't put enough emphasis on the deep thinker because they're not going to they're not going to come out in their meet in meetings and often just spew out all these ideas. They're the ones that are sitting back, usually quiet, but they're processing all that's being said around the table. Um, and I encourage leaders, those are the ones that you need to ask, hey, Sally, what are you thinking? Tom, I want to hear your perspective on that. And I will guarantee you, you will get some creative ideas out of those people that the others haven't thought of because they're, they're again, they're, they're usually very introspective, but they're processing stuff. And those, those people are often classified as introverts. Think of them differently. They're deep thinkers because all of us think and have ideas, but often you, they need to be drawn out. And then the other characteristic is, or the other person that I usually like to have on a team is an analytical person, somebody that can take those different data sets and look at it, look for correlations, um, and, and then take all the information that's being given and actually be able to process it and come up with new understandings. And so when you're building these teams, and I don't care what team, it might be a server team, it might be um, a cybersecurity SOC team, it, there's all... Every single team needs to be built around diversity of thought. And I will promise you this, it will be more productive. They'll come up with more creative solutions. There's been all kinds of studies out there that, that prove this true. And the final thing is, if you think in that way, it will also become a more diverse team because you don't have the same profile that you're looking for. And you'll look across those, and diversity happens, like race and sex and all, all of that happens when you're focused on diversity of thought. God, yes, we could talk about this topic for hours. And in my experience, having the diversity of thought within teams is, I will say, foundational in creating high-performing teams. The thing that... I believe a lot of leaders miss out on or maybe they don't fully understand is, yes, you have to bring this diverse team together, but in order to avoid absolute chaos, they have to trust one another. Mm -hmm. They have to be focused on a common mission, vision, and direction for them to go. Once they understand this is the mission, this is where we're trying to go, you have a lot more depth of knowledge in the cybersecurity space than I do. Maybe I've got more HR experience. Okay, well, Sean and Tim, we're going to go knock this stuff out. We're going to go get it all taken care of, right? Because you and I both know what we have to accomplish, okay? There are things that I will cede to you. and Okay, well, I'm going to have to defer to Tim on this, right? And there's things that you're going to say, you know what, Sean, you, you might understand people a little bit better. I'm going to let you run point on this, this litigation or, you know, whatever's going on here. But we have to trust one another. And that's where I think a lot of leaders miss out on, which is speaks to the importance of emotional intelligence, understanding what drives and motivates people, and being able to tie all of this stuff together to create that high-performing team. Mm. So how do we get leaders there? So I love your idea of trust, and I'll call it empowerment, right? So often our leaders, <clears throat> again, big egos get in the way uh, pretty frequently, and and we, we all have a certain way we want things done. The, the challenge with that is 
that if you continue to dictate how things are being done, you strip the ability for somebody to learn and to grow. And I've got uh, one, see, so one of his favorite sayings is, uh, he, he's like, you know, when somebody comes and, and asks me a question, um, he goes, I, I throw it back at them. And I say, well, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? And he goes, if the answer is acceptable enough, I allow them to do it. And so what, we're, what we should be doing as leaders is, is helping individuals uh, make better decisions. It's because I don't want to have to, to micromanage all of these decisions. What I really want is my leadership or, or the folks that report into me to make great decisions on their own, but they'll never be able to do that if I'm not entrusting and empowering them. And you know what? Sometimes they need to make a wrong decision and feel it. Because we're going to always grow from our failures way more than our successes. And, and, and too often as, as leaders, we're not giving them the authority to make those decisions. Um, and so I think the, the perfect example is when anybody asks you that question, hey, how do we do this? Well, tell me what you think. Tell me how you might want to approach that. And all of a sudden, you have built their own ego up some. You've built their self-confidence up so that, um, hey, that next time, maybe I don't, they don't need to come to me. I'll give you a, a quick example of what's happening uh, right now. I've got a, uh, a CIO that is looking to replace their CISO because the CISO um, just doesn't have that direction. They don't have the ability to really make decisions on their own. And, and this is a new uh, CIO that needs a, an empowered leadership to make sure that he is, he's moving the ball forward without him having to micromanage so much. And he's basically said, I need a leader that's going to make me look good without me having to tell them how to make me look good. I mean, that's, and it, so are you making your leadership look good without them telling you how to do it? Yeah. One of the things, so as you were talking through that, I was flashing back. There's an individual that I have worked with over a decade in the past, my former VP of IT, phenomenal leader, and watching him grow from that technology professional into a a technology focused business professional it's it's just beyond rewarding and fulfilling now to your point of making sure that they're they're going down the right path i envision this kind of like a bowling alley right there's there's the gutter on each side and as a leader we have to make sure that those gutters are defined mm. once those gutters are defined and you know hey i'm going towards these bowling pins let them go down whatever piece of the lane they want to go down as long as it's within those gutters. So that's something that that I found to be very helpful in, in empowering them while also making sure they're moving in the right direction. Now, another thing you said is when people come to you, well, how do we do that? All right. Now, as a leader, before we ask that question, almost a prerequisite of that is knowing, do they know how to do this. Mm -hmm. Because if my VP of IT comes up to me and asks me that question, and I know he probably knows the answer, I can comfortably say, how would you like to approach this? However, if a new HR admin comes in, she doesn't have any experience, and she says, how do I do this? That's not the person that you say, well, how would you like to do it? Yes. Because she doesn't have the knowledge or experience. So we have to understand, okay, what is the skill set? Do they understand what's going on? Can I empower them? Or are they new? Are they genuinely asking a question? How do I do that? Now I have to coach and guide and mentor them in that process. So we have to be aware of the strengths and weaknesses and where everybody falls on our team so that we can lead them how they need to be led. Yeah. And that goes to training, doesn't it? Right. So if we're not investing in our staff. So what's interesting in, in the surveys that we we do on <clears throat> retention, 
you know, because once you bring in good technologies, the last thing you want to do is lose them, right? And, and so, yes, money's important, but it's usually not the most important item that's out there. Uh, usually it's respect. Number one is that leaders need to, to um, be respecting and, and respecting and um, uh, giving accolades, you know, really building them, building individuals up to make them feel comfortable that they're doing a good job. Okay. Uh, in fact, I had a conversation with a, with a guy, uh, a red team leader that I had placed uh, just this morning. And, and uh, he was literally telling me that, you know, I really like where I'm working because the guy's not shy about giving me accolades and telling me that uh, we're doing a great job. He'll tell me when we're not, but it's the comfort knowing where you are in, in how you're performing. And so the second thing right below that is, is the company investing in me? Are they trying to make me a better person? Are they looking at me as a, as a career employee instead of just somebody that's filling this position, right? And so as we bring new employees in, are we really in, investing them not just uh, to, to get them to learn that position, but in the future, are we on, having ongoing training that's going to expand their mind, expand them, um, you know, across that particular role? Because, say, an HR analyst, um, you know, are they going to stick there for very long if you're not building them into something else? Or any technologist, right? You might have a great server technologist that you're like, ah, oh, I couldn't do without this person. Well, as soon as you start thinking that, you need to be training this person up to do something else or bringing somebody in behind them or, you know, um, investing in them so that they feel valuable enough to stick around. And I've got, uh, again, another CISO that I work with, and he said, that's my biggest challenge is how do I move technologists into a leadership mindset. And he said, some technologists don't want to be there. They are perfectly comfortable in uh, hitting the keystrokes and being behind that. But can I, can I get them to at least mentor others? And maybe a mentoring relationship breaks them out of their shell so that they become, begin seeing themselves as a leader and so that's been a really great technique is like, okay, partner them up with a more junior person and, and just have them, have them become the coach, you know? Yep. So a few things that I do want to touch on there is the importance of training, not just on the technology point, but to what you said is making sure that you're putting them in some sort of training program that's going to expand their minds a bit. Now, over the years, as I've gone through budgeting for organizations, training is something that is paramount, always has been, always will be to me, my team, my organization. Whenever it came time to make cuts, I would cut everything else before touching training. I would mm. always, always leave training in the budget because I wanted to make sure that these employees had access to it if they wanted to. Now, in my experience, only 20, 25% of them would actually use it, but I wanted to make sure that it was there for them. And the people that used it, they valued it, they appreciate it, they stuck around. There's still times, years later, they'll call me up, hey, I, sounds and, silly, but thank you for sending me to that training. And, and those are the probably the ones that are accelerating to the company more, right? Because if yep. they're investing in themselves like yep. that. Yeah. And then, so the other piece is whenever... You put somebody in that mentorship role. You get a sense of, do they have what it takes to be a leader? And I actually enjoy identifying those traits within people and sometimes they don't even see that in themselves. Going back to the VP that I was just telling you about, it took more time than I care to admit for me to be able to hire him from an engineer role at a consulting firm into an infrastructure manager role, like a very long time to convey, well, I'm not a manager. I've never been a manager. I was like, I know this is for you. 
because I had watched him with others. I had watched him mentor and coach others. He wasn't in the role. And this speaks to how powerful it is for, we'll say, mid to upper leaders to identify those traits in people and then start putting them in those positions to see if they start to latch on to it more and grow and shine. Because inevitably, at some point, a director role is going to open up. And when the business leaders come to me, who do we need to put in this role? Well, the guy who's already doing it, of course. So let's promote him because he's kind of been doing it already. So as technology professionals, when you start shifting from that role of individual contributor into a mentor, a guide, a coach, a leader, even if you're not getting paid for it, even if you don't have the official title, the opportunity when it arises, you're going to be a shoe in for it. Yeah. And, and that's another um, reason to pair up a coach. I wish com- more companies would see this as an investment in their employees, right? Okay, I've got a guy I think has that potential, but doesn't maybe understand what management really needs to look like. And and I think that that first step into management uh, is probably the most difficult because they come in again, I'm the t- I know so much. They've got these egos that that I, they're I, I want, you know, my workers to do it the way I did it. And so that's when you really need the coach to step in and go, okay, you got to let go. You got to stop being the one that's actually turning the knobs. In fact, one of the the number one things that these uh, Fortune 500 CISO said was pull yourself out of the technology. Start entrusting your leaders that report to you to do that part. And and if they start pulling you down back into the technology, you say, you know, get a get a 50,000 foot view and then allow them to solve it. And and so at a, at a smaller level, when that person takes his first supervisory role, they have to start thinking like that. And, and it's it's a very difficult transition. It is. And, and I'm going to share a little bit of a story. God, this was probably 12, 12, 13 years ago. I was making that transition from, we'll say, solutions architect focused on building data centers into leading a team of engineers. Had, we'll say, 20, 23 people at any given time on my team. We had a massive data center build. It was a multi million dollar data center build, just a project on its own that took an entire year. I spent the, that year killing myself, working crazy, insane hours, making sure that we met every single deadline and beating my head against a wall, asking the question, why am I the only one who's doing it? I've got a team of over 20 people here. They're all phoning it in 35, 40 hours a week. And here I am working 70 to 80. But I met every single deadline, every single one of them. Year goes by, sit down for my annual performance review with a director of IT at the time who's been a mentor to me for the majority of my life. And he sits down, I'm thinking, okay, on a ranking of five, I was thinking maybe three, three and a half, three point eight, something like that. You know, there's a few missteps that I had along the way, but thinking that I was being realistic and I step in and get a two on my performance review. Wow. And, oh yeah, that's right. Oh, and you my worked God. so hard, I worked right? So freaking hard. <laughs> that was an uncomfortable conversation. And I looked back on it. Oh, man, I didn't. T- and whenever we were sitting down, I was just fuming. I was I, I could not comprehend it. Now, years go by. He is still a mentor. It took me many years to sit down and say, hey, um, hmm, really struggled with that. And he said, well, here's the deal. You were in a leadership role, but you weren't leading. You were doing. You were killing yourself while your team was phoning it in. Now, the, not the entire team, but the team was pretty much phoning it in. That, too, was ranking you as a leader. And I thought, no. oh. he said, and my immediate response was, you could have told me that along the way. And his response back was, but would you have learned the lesson? Yeah. So sometimes it takes a jarring event to shake us to our core, to get us to understand, you're no longer in this role. You have to grow. You have to stretch and learn as a leader. Now, I still look back and still give him a hard time. I was like, man, you probably could have done that a little bit differently, but I wouldn't have learned the lesson. 
And sometimes we have to jar these people and put them in a situation. And you touched on something earlier. Sometimes these people have to fail. Yeah. I've done that in the past as well. When the same VP of IT, he wanted to do a project with a big bang cut over. I'm like, mm, you think maybe we want to stage this with a few other? No, no, we got it. We got it. And I was like, okay. Well, they didn't got it. It went bad. And when that happened, my role turned into the protector, shielding him and his team so that they could get the work done. Lesson was learned on his part. But man, th that speaks to how important it is to be dynamic as a leader and look out for people. And sometimes you got to make tough decisions. Sometimes you got to jar people. They're not going to like it, but it is for the best. Yeah. And, and failure is the biggest um, you know, way we learn, you know, because uh, again, I guess it's a kind of a mantra of mine, especially in this industry, is is the ego. I know I struggle with it. Most leaders struggle with it because we are we are built up to uh, be the face of either the company or the the particular division or whatever, right? And so everything's supposed to roll up to you. So you need to kind of buck up and all right, I've I've got this. But the reality is. Um, <laughs> Many many leaders today, with the millennials and the and the Gen Ys, and all, you know, if if you're bucking up and you're kind of expecting the same thing that maybe we grew up with, I mean, we were we were willing to be the grunts out there, right? And 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 uh, do it for years and years and years in order to earn the right into this role. And so now that we've achieved that role, we don't want to give up, give it up or give up that power. But the reality is today, today's world's different. Um, we need to continue to focus on that empowerment um, and, and building the leaders up underneath us because the, the more we surround us with capable people, the, it, the higher it allows us to actually go up in the organization. Again, it all, all com comes back to if we're surrounded by people that are competent and um, can raise our ability to to be more business focused. It allows us to go higher into that executive strategic level because that's where we all hope to play in. But we got to understand that strategic level. How do we as coaches get more technology professionals that have massive egos to understand the importance? of development, the importance of working with a coach. Because whenever I think back to my early 30s or late 20s, yeah, you, you couldn't have paid me to go see a coach because my mindset was, oh, I've got this. I know. How do we help them get there? Yeah, I, I wish I had a silver bullet for that, really. And that's Kind of our society. I see it all across. I have, I have a wonderful opportunity. I work with uh, foster children, uh, foster teens. I work with a lot of teens in uh, alcohol recovery, um, and you, you know, sometimes you have to have this massive impact for somebody to be willing enough to change what they're doing, and too often. Um, especially as adults, the longer we're an adult, the more rigid we are in our um, personality. And it's very difficult to change. And so there are some great books that are around, around this uh, topic. Uh, um, i trying to think of Change or Die is an awesome book. Um, but but the challenge is you got to be willing. And sometimes I just say, hey, you got to be willing to be willing, right? Because some of us aren't even willing to be willing. And if you're not going to look at yourself honestly and say, okay, I'm going to take this and I'm going to start practicing uh, these things and, and you got to make new habits out of it. In fact, another good book is, hab is Habit, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just... We want, we want to uh, be able to change the habits. And habits can be a behavior. How do I treat somebody else? And that's, that's where I have focused a lot of time is recognizing individuals for their strengths um, and how they are. I mean, just some people are, 
or this is how they're going to behave, which is why I like this, this Berkman. And if I understand how they are, then I can interact with them in a different way. In fact, when I, when I place somebody like a new leader, um, I actually do what I call an employee operating manual. I'll take this, this Berkman and all, all the stuff we know about them, and in a one-pager, this is how they are. This is what motivates them. This is how you should not communicate with them, right? This is going to set them off, um, but this is how you can uh, incentivize them. And it's not just always money. Sometimes it's, it's different ways you can incentivize somebody. And so if you understand that walking in the door, you'll know that person like you've known them for five, six years. Yeah. You know, the thing that I've come to realize how powerful it is is people like you and I, whenever we get on stage, whenever we're doing an interview on a podcast, on YouTube, sharing stories of our experiences yeah. because we have lived it and talking through the lessons that we have learned and sharing what we learned and then how to get there. Mm. Because there's an incredible amount of power in the stories that we tell. And a lot of the content that I create and share and whenever I speak on panels or give keynotes is, is sharing my story. And it doesn't resonate with everybody, but it will resonate with the right people. And mm. if it forces them to think, oh, my God. I just lived that last year. Yeah. Right. Wow. Exactly. Maybe I need to listen to this. Maybe I need to do a little bit of research. And in my experience, almost every time I'm on stage and come down, multiple people will come have a conversation. Oh, my God, this, this spoke to me. Tell me more about this. And so I think the things that you're doing with public speaking, and you're an author, if I remember correctly. Yes, so there's a lot of things that you're doing to help coach and guide and develop these technology professionals and just leaders in general. So I think that once we get to this point in our life and career, we have a responsibility to turn around and pull people along and show them. And sometimes you have to pull them. And sometimes mm -hmm. you can just shine a light and they'll pursue it themselves. But I feel it's a responsibility that we have. Yeah. yeah. And I think as we become more gray hair, you know, we, we hopefully have earned that level of what I call the sage, right? So the sage is, is a more of a humble leader that, that um, has a lot of wisdom because they've been through uh, not just the good times, but the bad times, right? I have, again, I, I've got a lot of mistakes that I've learned from. I've lost a lot of money by investing in wrong technologies. I've, uh, you know, I've, I've built five different technology firms and it has been, uh, it's been a wild ride. So I think when you get to this age and, and unfortunately many of what I'll call the sages out there are being pushed out of their roles for younger folks that are coming along. But I, th I think if you can take um, some of that wisdom and start going, hey, look, I've seen it. And, and here's some of the advice that I can give you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to what you have to say. And, and I may not be fully right, but I can at least tell you my experiences. This is what happened to me. And if you want to learn from that, you're welcome to. Well, that speaks to how important it is that people be ready to hear the message. Yeah. People be ready to get to that next place. And, and you mentioned earlier, change is hard, yes. right? And a lot of times it really comes down to, is the pain of staying where we're at more than the pain of change? And once you flip that turning point, that's when your life starts to change. And it's actually, it continues through other areas of our life because once we recognize, wow, this was really painful and change is hard and scary, but look at how much I've grown. Look at how much I've learned. Oh, well, will that correlate into fitness or mindfulness or family? Or there's all yes. these other things. And once we're able to cross that threshold and recognize how powerful it is, to change while scary, that's whenever our lives can start getting better. Yeah. And, and that's, 
that's one of the reasons I even bring up this whole uh, teen recovery thing. We, we had that opportunity to go through that. And I look at it as an opportunity. It was super painful when we had one of our teens go off the rails, right? And, and it was interesting. We wanted to fix this teen. Um, what we realized is that we were the ones that needed to be fixed. And until you hit this bottom, often you're not willing to, to change the routines, how you think, how you interact with people. And, and what's so awesome about this and, and why I guess I'm really passionate about it is because I can now see, we, we host uh, uh, these teen recovery camp outs at our property a couple times a year. And you can see them from, you know, every six months that they show up, um, some of them will come in really downtrodden and, you know, almost, uh, you know, hiding behind the hoodie. And the next time the hoodie's off, you know, and the next time they're now, they're, it's like this light has come into them and they, they've just totally been transformed. And it's just a beautiful thing to see. And to be able to see these teens graduate into these these little adults, they can have a, adult conversations and they're just, it's beautiful. But it makes me realize how many grown adults don't go through this process of, of understanding who they really are and not having to, to um, I guess, prove to others that they're good enough, right? That, that they are so self-confident, they don't have to continually prove that out there. And and many technology leaders, I, I, I love them. My whole business is, is centered around this. Um, there are some that absolutely understand this concept um, that I can lead confidently, but I don't need to, to uh, uh, come, down, come down harshly in that, in that way. Um, for them to uh, really understand people to their core and to be willing to make these these dramatic changes from I'm just a technologist to now I can be a business leader. I can interact with other individuals, understand where they're coming from, and I can help them get to where they need to be. And it's really, I think the whole thing is, is focused on serving others, being their partner and, and being compassionate for the position that they're in just makes a radical change from what I'll call, and, and maybe guilty by association, uh, you know, technologists are often looked at as being just heads down computer folks. And we need to be lifting our eyes up. We need to be really interacting uh, and being compassionate for somebody else in the position that they're in and helping them get to where they ultimately want to be. Damn, we could go on for hours. We could. I just love <laughs> these conversations. I know you have a very important lunch that you have to get to. So I do appreciate you coming in. What is the best way for people to contact you? So you can reach me uh, through FortifyExperts.com or Tim Howard at FortifyExperts.com. I'd love to have conversations around this. This is an area I'm super passionate about. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I will make sure that we have all of Tim's contact information in the show notes. Do all the typical like, subscribe, share this content. We'll be creating a lot of clips and reels from this episode that I'm really excited about. Y'all have a good one. <laughs>